morning, everyone. Today is December 16th, 2021, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every week, Gene Lawler and I are very happy to host another cutting edge webinar with a great guest, and Sarah Agamiri is doing all the wonderful logistical work for us today. We appreciate that very much. There's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And every week, one of our favorite parts of the program is to report to you on the running total of just how generous our wonderful audiences have been. Jean, could you please fill us in on how much our audiences have contributed so far to fight food insecurity worldwide? Sure, and it's truly global. And these, these numbers are, of course, only for the donations or contributions about which someone has told Natalie Armstrong Motan, the founder of uh, this program, uh, this Will Work for Food. Um, and I'm sure that the actual amounts are much greater, but we're ending the year no, knowing of $217,122, getting close to a quarter of a million dollars, more than 2 million meals. And it's just fantastic. It's just fantastic. Thank you. And unfortunately, um, Natalie couldn't be here with us today. She's winging her way over the Atlantic, even as we speak, or over the, the North Pole, maybe right about now, um, heading back finally uh, to the United States from France. That's great. Thank you so much, Jean. And we miss Natalie. We look forward to seeing her in the new year. So let's tell you a little bit about our terrific speaker today, Jerry O'Sullivan. Jerry O'Sullivan delivers professional mediation training accredited by the Mediators Institute of Ireland, where she lives, and she provides mediation services through her company, O'Sullivan Solutions. She's been working in the areas of facilitation and conflict resolution for over 35 years. Jerry has authored The Mediator's Toolkit, Formulating and Asking Questions for Successful Outcomes. It is published by New Society Publishing Canada. She has also developed an advanced training program based on this book. It's also delivered online at O'SullivanSolutions.ie. I suspect it's not too late for those uh, people on your Christmas list for whom you, you just don't know what to get, well, probably Jerry's book is, is the ideal stocking stuffer for people all over the world. Jerry's certified in organizational and workplace mediation, community mediation, civil and commercial mediation, and in separating couples mediation. Her expertise is in working with, with disputes with a high emotional content, such as clerical sexual abuse, family, and community disputes. Jerry, we're just so excited and delighted to have you with us today for what I know will be a very exciting and educational interactive workshop. Please tell us about the food bank that's important to you and then please help educate us. Our friend, Jerry O'Sullivan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you to Natalie and Will Work for Food for inviting me. Um, and it's, it's good, good evening for me because it's four o'clock in the evening here. It's coming to uh, shutting down for a relaxation, relaxation evening. So Trokra, Trokra is the uh, project that I have chosen. And Trokra is the Irish language word for compassion. It's in existence in Ireland for nearly 50 years. And it, I thought I would go back to basics because what it actually it does. Sorry. I'll keep going, yeah? So, yes. Yes, I just heard, I thought someone was uh, um, asking a question there. So Trokra, uh, one of the many things it does is it, it works with people in water, uh, water safety and, and water um, access. And it also uh, works with people in showing how to grow food uh, for their own use. So I thought I would bring it right back to basics at, at production level and at safety level. So um, that's, that's Trokra, and thank you to all of those who, who may subscribe. Um, I'm sure Trokra and its, its uh, clients around the world will be very grateful. Um, so I developed the, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to show a very quick PowerPoint, three or four slides, just to introduce the S questions model, which I developed in my book. And then what I'm going to do 
is work with just one of those questions, the journey of inference questions. And I'll deliver this to you through a PowerPoint presentation with, with some motion graphics and also a filmed case study uh, with two parties from the case scenario that you would have received by email. If you haven't looked at this yet, it's the case scenario is in the chat box on the very top first message. If you want to have a look at it uh, just before I, I, I turn on that phone. Uh, the second thing I'm going to do then is to is to work with you around how to challenge a person's journey of inference. And I will do that through using um, other, what I call other people questions with uh, just another quick clip of a filmed role play, just about the role players. There are two mediators um, that are accredited by the Mediators Institute of Ireland. It's not a real case. Sometimes people think it is. It's not actually a real case. And if you should ever happen to meet either of these parties, they ask that you don't tease them about uh, their role. And uh, the other thing I need to say about the filmed scenarios is that they are completely unscripted. So you are getting the unfiltered responses of Cathy, who is the person I will be concentrating on for this demonstration. So I just want to bring up a quick PowerPoint before moving into the, the uh, films. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, just This is just a brief overview of the model. Um, you are all very familiar of the S1 subject matter. You've been, we've been working in that area for years. The same with the structure. The structure meaning, is it a closed or an open question? And the seeking information questions, that's, that's what we've been doing for years as well. But what I wanted to develop um, in my book and in developing this model, I wanted to develop some questions that would result in people having a paradigm shift in their thinking. And I have developed eight of them. And this is the one journey of inference we will concentrate on. And then we will move to a, 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 just a, a snippet of other people questions. Um, that's, so I'm going to go straight into, uh, sorry, hold on. Uh, I, I absolutely hate technology. I just want to say that bit first. And when I'm talking about my work, I get very passionate and I talk very fast. So if you find with my Irish accents that I'm talking too fast in our general conversation, just please shout in and let me know that I need to slow down. And that would I would really appreciate uh, you doing that. So just before I show the film, the purpose of Journey of Inference questions is twofold. Uh, it's to identify and challenge people's uh, uh, interpretations and assumptions and whatever distorted information that they may have. And the second purpose is to make an unconscious thinking process conscious. So in other words, to make conscious what happens between when we experience an event or react to our, our, our sorry, when we experience a, an event and when we react to it by making a particular decision or by um, by taking a particular action. And, and before I start, I want to tell you a story. I was training in Dublin, which is about 200 miles or I think 300 kilometers from me. And I had a lot of heavy bags and I was moving from the hotel where I had been delivering the training, the training was over, to a restaurant for a business meeting. That's really important that you know it was a business meeting. It was only about a mile of a journey so the first thing that happened is, well, I booked the taxis to the reception at the, at the hotel and I went to the door of a hotel, a taxi drove up and I opened the door and he said, the taxi driver said, no, it's not for you. And I said, OK, I said, is it for Jerry O'Sullivan by any chance? And he said, well, yes, it is, actually. And I said, well, I'm Jerry O'Sullivan, but I'm a female Jerry O'Sullivan. And for those of you who don't know, Jerry is usually, uh, like Tom and Jerry the mouse, Jerry is usually a male name. So that was his first inference and we laughed. So I, I sat into the taxi and he asked me where I was going and I told him I was going to a particular restaurant and he said, so you're going for brunch, being, you know, halfway between breakfast and lunch. And I said, well, no, I'm going for a meeting. I said, but if I had been Jerry the man, where would you have thought I was going? And he laughed and he said, well, 
I would have thought you were going to a meeting, actually, not for brunch. So we laughed again and we talked about making inferences. And as we arrived at the restaurant, he had me take my bags out of the, the, the boot, the trunk of his car. And he said to me, have a lovely weekend away. You need a break. You need a rest after all that hard work. And I said, I'm not going away. I'm not from Dublin. I'm not leaving here for the weekend. I'm actually going home. And of course, we laughed again. So in the space of about five or seven minutes, the taxi driver made three journeys of inference. OK, and they all came from his belief system. And what he actually demonstrated was the end product or result of what was his unconscious thinking process until he came to the space where he he asked me my question about was I going for brunch or was I going away for the weekend? So what I'm going to show you in the film role play, I'm taking Kathy, who was one of the characters of the, the uh, um, film case scenario I showed you. I'm taking Kathy through a, her unconscious thought process about what she thought was happening when Tom came to apologize to her. OK. Um, First, I present the, the theory and then we'll go into the filmed role play. Um, and I want you to imagine that Cathy is alone at a separate meeting. Now, Tom is in the room with her, but that's for a different training purpose. But I want you to imagine that these questions are first asked at a separate meeting. And they, their purpose is, as I said, to make an unconscious uh, uh, thought process conscious because it's only that with which we can then work. So let me go for the film and uh, watch that. Journey of inference questions take a party through the information a person selects during a precipitating event. These questions take them through the interpretations they make about that information, the assumptions they make, and the conclusions they then reach. And this journey is informed by a person's belief system. And this then influences any actions that they may take. Parties make their own unique journeys of inference based on their unique perspective and belief system. So let me take you through the story of Mary and Anne. Mary and Anne were good enough friends. They both worked together in a hospital. They weren't very, very, very close friends, but they would go on office nights out. They had sharing of some interests. But recently, Anne had noticed that things weren't quite the same with Mary. There was something wrong. And Anne had just that little niggle about it, not knowing what was happening, but being uncomfortable with the way she felt Mary had been recently. But the reality of what happened is that Anne walked down the hospital corridor. Mary walked past her. This was the actual reality of what happened. But if we move here to what happens when we come across something like this and our expectations are a little bit unsure as to what is going to happen. So we unknowingly select and filter the data that we take in from the situation that happened. And the data we select is influenced by our beliefs and our world view. So in this case, what Anne saw was that Mary didn't smile, she didn't say hello to me, and she completely ignored me. So the next thought process, conscious or unconscious, that we go through is that somebody like Anne makes an interpretation about what has happened with Mary. The interpretation means, and I just ask if for the first time since I've shown this, the typing is completely blurred. Is that what everybody else is seeing? Can I ask Sarah or Jeff or Jean? It's a little blurry. It's very blurry. Um, okay, um, I just, sorry, let me, I think, I'm, yeah, I'm so sorry. Let me just go back and check. Yes, I had clicked the optimization. 
Okay, uh, I'll have to start again. Sorry about this. I'll bring you back to that particular place where it was. Anne. Mary and Anne were good and some their, ex their expectations are a little bit unsure as to what is going to happen. So we unknowingly select and filter the data that we take in from the situation that happened. And the data we select is influenced by our beliefs and our world view. So in this case, what Anne saw was that Mary didn't smile she didn't say hello to me and she completely ignored me. So the next thought process, conscious or unconscious, that we go through is that somebody like Anne makes an interpretation about what has happened with Mary. The interpretation means the action of explaining the meaning of something. So Anne's interpretation was that this must mean that Mary is trying to avoid me. She then goes on to make an assumption, an assumption being a thing that is accepted as true or as certain to happen without proof. Anne's assumption at this stage was she must not like me anymore and she probably wants to end the friendship. She then goes to reach a conclusion, which is a judgment or a decision. The conclusion that Anne comes to is that all the people that Mary knows probably don't want to have anything to do with me anymore, but I don't care. Our conclusions are influenced by our beliefs. And these beliefs, which you would have seen earlier in the introductory module, these beliefs are based on our experience of the world around us. They become the rules of our operating system. So one of Anne's beliefs is that people always gang up together. They never seek the truth. So the action that Anne takes is based on this belief. So what Anne decides is I will show them that I don't need them. I won't look in their direction when I walk into the lab laboratory. I won't talk to them. I will have nothing more to do with them. So this concept of the journey of inference illustrates how our paradigm or our worldview determines how we respond to situations when we are in conflict with each other or even during our ordinary everyday actions. As we've learned, our response will be governed by the amount of information and the type of information that we absorb and by the emotions that surface for us when we're interpreting the information that we do actually process. Unfortunately, we are hardwired to notice negative things first, and this is our amygdala acting as our threat detector. So in the situation here with Anne, her first piece of data that she observed was that Mary didn't smile, she didn't say hello, and that she completely ignored me. So this is her threat detector informing the interpretation she's going to make. As further incidences of this cycle continue, it begins to escalate and we see less and less of the external information available to us as more and more incidences occur. If we don't have personal insight and are not sufficiently emotionally intelligent, this journey that we take in our heads, it's our thought process in our heads, this journey is taken without reference to any self-reflection or self-questioning or any seeking of contradictory evidence. The key to this in mediation is to link the action that a party took with the interpretations that they made. And when this is done, the party who is sitting listening to this journey of inference um, and listening to the mediator taking the other party through this series of questions begins to see uh, that's why you did what you did.
During a conflict, each party reacts to the other's actions and this increases misunderstandings between them and leads them into a cycle of conflict that becomes entrenched. This is because parties are only looking for the information that will affirm their initial perceptions and interpretations. And this results in the information that they see becoming less and less and increasingly distorted. Now, you might be asking about what exactly was going on for Mary. Uh, it turned out that that morning, Mary's husband had just told her that after lots of discussion and consideration that he wanted a divorce. And this is the frame of mind in which not alone did Mary come to work that morning, but it's also the frame of mind that had been playing on her for the previous few months as these discussions between herself and her husband had started two to three months prior to this. So Anne's whole niggle was unjustified if she thought it was about Mary's view of their friendship or Mary's view of Anne. It was solely to do with Mary's home experience. I want to show you the methodology. So the first thing we do is we hear the narrative, asking journey of inference questions. And these are questions that are based on the actual image of the journey of inference. So we first ask what happened? What did you observe? Then we ask, what did you think that meant? And then having interpreted that way, we ask, what assumption did you make? And sometimes people, parties might have difficulty in, in, in understanding the difference between interpretations and assumptions in a, in a situation of great stress at a mediation. So what I would usually ask for assumption is, what did you assume might happen next? And then I ask, what was your general conclusion about all of this? And then sometimes, but not always, I'll ask them, what belief do you have about the world, about how it works, how people are in the, how people are within that world that confirms for you that you were right in your interpretation in the first instance? When I say I don't always ask this, it's because by the time the uh, assumption and conclusion has reached, uh, it becomes very clear to the other party that there has been a huge misinterpretation. And then this gets discussed at this stage. The last question I ask is what action did you take? When two parties are in the room or when you're, you're asking these questions in the first instance at a separate meeting, it's really important to ask them to link the action they took back to the interpretation that they made. And I want to ask you, um, Cathy, when Tom came to apologise, what did you see? What did you observe? Mm. I noticed we were always alone um, and that was probably calculated or it was a, you know, kind of waiting for me to be alone so that he could come and talk to me. Um, I noticed he was quite anxious, um, overly keen or very eager to, to talk, even though I didn't want to. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what okay. I noticed. So you noticed too, was you were on, always, it was when you were on your own? Mm. and that uh, Tom appeared anxious and keen. What you mentioned that the difficulty for you when you were speaking earlier was that that Tom um, continued to come back and apologise. Yeah. What did you interpret that as meaning? When it continued and continued and continued, I yeah. thought he's trying to create this space where he could where he could talk to me. Okay, um, so trying to create a space to talk with you. Yeah, maybe. All right. And what did you assume from that? What did you think might happen? I thought maybe he'll use that space to make another advance. Maybe he didn't get my message the first time that I really didn't, this is something I don't want. And he was wondering, still wondering whether I had an interest or not, you know, I thought okay. maybe he'd take advantage of it. So maybe checking out whether he had an interest and what conclusion did you come to about all of that? Hello? 
I think my conclusion was because it was so repeated, it was so continual that mm. he definitely would make advance again. It was just a matter of when, not if. Okay. Okay. So you felt that Tom would definitely make an advance mm. again. So it felt like, yeah. And it wasn't about if, it was when it was going to happen. I felt assaulted, you know. I felt it was constant and I was on Tinder hooks and, yeah. Okay. And how did that conclusion feel? feed into your belief system, how the world works, how people are in the world, how they behave. Honestly, and I hate to say it, but a typical man, I just thought male entitlement, just thought he never asked me once whether I had an interest. He made an assumption that I did and then just made a move. And, you know, that was something that had happened to me before in previous jobs where I had to set boundaries, like nothing major, but just, mm. yeah, I had to set boundaries on, a, you know, so, yeah, I think. Okay, yeah. so male entitlement, I think, was the word you used. Okay. The actions taken by a party are based on their interpretations, assumptions, conclusions and beliefs. So when I asked Cathy about the actions that she took, she said she used to try to cut off Tom from speaking with her because the more he tried to talk with her, the more harassed she felt. And she said she did this because she just wanted to put the memory of that staff night out behind her because she wanted to move on. It is this linking of one party's actions to their interpretations and assumptions that leads to the other party's understanding. Okay, so uh, just a couple of uh, guidelines on using this series of questions before we stop for um, a, a, a Q&A session. Um, Cathy's belief was that this sort of behavior is typical of all men. So if Cathy has a belief system that this is how men operate, then it becomes very clear why she made the interpretations and assumptions and came to the conclusions that she did, that Tom was going to make another advance. Um, and I just want to tell you briefly what Tom's journey of inference was. Uh, and you'll begin to see that the, 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 the purpose for this was because during the separate meetings with each party, I discovered that they had a different interpretation of what each other's intention was during those episodes when Tom was trying to apologize. So Tom uh, would say for his interpretation or his observation, he said there was no eye, eye contact. It was hard to connect with her. She was nervous that sometimes she was recalling that there was resistance, that she was uncomfortable. And he had a sense that she didn't believe me and that it got worse, that she didn't believe his apology is what he thought. So his interpretation was, he said, I don't know what to think, but I know something. He said, it's not good. OK, he just said there was such a strong blocking out from her. She was afraid. She was nervous. I think he said she reached the wrong conclusion. I think some button was pushed, but it wasn't good. It wasn't good, he said. I didn't feel understood. I couldn't apologize properly. So when I asked him about her assum his assumptions of what might happen next, he said, I don't know what people are saying. He said, people must be talking. And when the dynamic changes in an office or in a, in a team like this, everything falls apart. And it's the not knowing what's coming next, he said. It's very, very destabilizing. So his conclusion was that others will think the worst of me because it's now frosty. He described the uh, atmosphere as being Baltic. And he said, well, you know, I'm a man, she's a woman. So what are people thinking? And his belief, so I asked him what it was that informed his, his, his uh, conclusion or his interpretation and all of that series of questions. And his belief system is the voice that is heard is the truth. Right. And in this case, there's an absence of a voice, my voice. Therefore, the truth isn't coming out. So you can uh, you can probably guess that if, if you there was time to show you the full clip, that having heard Cathy's and having listened briefly to what Tom's journeys of the journey of inference was, that it would lead to a huge uh, um, 
understanding between both parties as to what exactly has happened. So just a few guidelines. One, always ask at a separate meeting. I would never, ever ask these at the joint session because I have no idea what's going to come out and whether it's going to be inflammatory. I have no idea. The second thing I do, if I'm unsure about asking a qu any question, if I'm unsure about asking it, I filter it through the principles of mediation. I ask myself, is this in any way going to put the parties in a more vulnerable position? Is it going to breach voluntariness in any way? Is it going to breach impartiality or confidentiality? And, and will my question in any way lessen their set, their, 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 the principle of self-determination um, within the mediation process? And I'm always like Colombo, and everyone in the world seems to know who Colombo is. Colombo was a little bit dumb. He was very curious, very tentative. Well, he, he wasn't dumb. He pretended he was very dumb, very gentle and very curious. And that's the type of body language I will use. So when you're asking these questions, you need to stay on track. And the reason you need to stay on track is because you are taking them through the steps of their own thinking process. So if you go off track and ask another kind of, kind of question, such as, and how did you feel or what was it like for you when that happened, which is what we would usually do. If you do that, you're taking them off their train of thinking. So we want to keep them on the track from their, their observation through all the stages to their actual conclusion, their action and their belief. Um, and that's, I, I find when I'm training mediators in this technique, uh, that is the hardest thing that they find to do. But it's like any new skill, the hardest thing to do is to stop doing what you already have been doing for about 30 or 20 years, whatever length of time it might be. So you've got to stay on, on, on track. And I may only need to do one, to do these questions with one party. So for example, if I find, at the separate meeting for both of them that that only one, not in this case, but in any case, that only one party has made a journey of inference, then I'll work with them. I'll also work with them to explore through the stages, which is what I'm going to show you next. Um, and that in itself might be enough for them to, to have a paradigm shift in their thinking and approach to the other person. If that, um, um, if that, isn't, uh, if it's for more, more than one person having this, I'll do it with both people and I will bring them both together to take them through the journey of inference, again, having heard it at a separate meeting, just to make sure there's nothing inflammatory there. Um, so any any questions on, on, on this before I move? We could just have five minutes. I don't know if Jeff or Jean are managing the chat or ask the questions directly through audio, that's I'm much more comfortable and happier with to have that chat. Uh, Jerry, there are no questions in the chat right now. Okay, uh, so anybody wants to come in with something? One or two questions before I move to the next section? Okay, I'll move on. And um, what, there are lots of things we can do to start to challenge Kathy's thinking around this. Um, and I have in, 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 in my book, I have from pages, I think it's 107 to, yeah, to 111, I have loads of examples of questions for each, each stage. But what I actually want to do with you now is I want to, to show you, just give you an example of what I call other people questions. I'm not going to give you the background theory, I'm just going to go straight into the role play with Kathy. Um, what I find about other people's questions is, is that they are a very safe way of asking a very challenging question. And you heard me mention the amygdala in, in, in the first film. So what I'm always trying to do with parties is not in any way to inadvertently put them into a position where they're feeling vulnerable or fearful. Because if I do that, the oxygen and the glucose from their frontal rational, logical thinking brain leaves that part of their brain to service their amygdala until they start to soothe down again. And when that oxygen and glucose has left their frontal brain, they cannot think rationally or logically. And I always remember as a kid, maybe about seven or eight, when I couldn't do my maths, my sums, my dad would help me. And he used to always say, sure, would you just calm down? He said, you can't think straight when you're all worked up like that. 
And I thought, how on earth did a man born in 1919 know about neuroscience? But obviously people knew it from, from experience in those days. So when I started to learn about the amygdala, my dad and my sons, am I getting worked up about them, was the first thing that came to my mind, excuse me, <clears throat> the first thing that came to my mind, and I, and I have to say I did laugh. So I am, um, I am, this is why I'm asking other people questions. I'm only asking two. I would never ask two questions together like this in a real mediation. This is for a training purpose. And Tom is in the room uh, as well, listening intently to these, to, 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 to Kathy's answers. The first question is going to be from the perspective of a, a, a conflict observer. And the second question would be putting Kathy on a balcony to look down at herself. And I don't know if any of you have read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, but he often says, if we're getting upset about something or stressed about something that we need to go to the balcony and what he means by go to the balcony is go down and look at yourself and you can see it in a much more rational way than when you're emotionally involved in it so that's what I'm trying to do with with that particular question um, in the document I was emailed and in the second chat from the top on the uh, chat box you will just see typed out the responses that Kathy gave me when I took her through the journey of inference in the film you saw I want, uh, just now. And what I want you to do is compare the answers that she gives for each of the two different questions um, to, to, to the ones that she initially gave. OK, so there, if you haven't seen, seen it in your email, they're in the second message from the top in the chat box. So have I anything else to do or to say? And again, it's unscripted, completely unscripted. And I, I do remember after the film, when I went back and looked after the filming, when I back, went back and looked at it, I couldn't believe what Cathy had said when I asked the questions in that way. All right, next film. Uh, And these are only brief snippets from each of these training programs. I'm trying to fit it all into the into the hour for you. So instead of just generally asking these questions of Kathy, what I'm going to do is ask them from two different perspectives. I'm going to ask Kathy if she was on a balcony, what would she have seen, interpreted, assumed, etc. And then the second method I'm going to use I'm, is I'm going to ask her um, what would be the perspective of an external conflict observer if they were looking at, at what was happening when Tom was uh, apologizing to Cathy. So in your workbook, um, I have uh, written in the responses that Cathy gave when I first asked her about her interpretation when I first asked her about her assumptions and also her conclusion. So it would be really helpful if you have that open in front of you while you watch the film and you see how Cathy responds to these questions when they're asked using an other people method. Um, what's important to say is that none of these films, a, a, a role play, a demonstrating a role play of a mediation, are scripted. They are all done with the parties or the person who's taking the role of the party with their own thoughts and feelings and how they would be if they were in that situation. So they are not scripted and, and, and that will help you to see uh, even more clearly the response that someone can, could genuinely give if they are asked these questions. So the first film, as I said, I'm going to show you is one where I challenge Kathy's journey of inference using other people's questions. Can I just ask you the question from a different perspective? If you yourself had been on a balcony looking down at the two of you, what might you have interpreted? What, did, what might you have thought was going on there? Probably just would have seen an awkwardness and a discomfort between two people. Okay, and maybe a bit of fear, you know. Um, fear, awkwardness and, dis and discomfort between two and fear with 
Mm, or yeah, fear, but uh, I don't know for for both maybe you know, or an anxiety there for both maybe fear is the wrong word, but okay, so anxiety for discomfortable, both. yeah, awkward, just yeah. neither of them wanting to be in that situation, kind of okay, and neither of them wanting to be there. So what is it from the back of you might have assumed might happen next, given that interpretation? Um. Looking down on those two people, mm. um, I don't know. The assumption would be that they, whatever relationship they had, would be gone, you know, or that it wouldn't function properly, or that they wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. I suppose. I, okay. If they're feeling that level of discomfort and anxiety around each other, then okay, and that they wouldn't be able to communicate with, with, effectively with, with, with each other. Yeah. Okay. Or on a positive note, you know, to be able to. Okay, and as an overall conclusion, then, if you were again, you're still up in the balcony looking down, what would you have concluded? Um, what I have concluded. Mm. That was the end of it. <laughs> I don't that, know. That, that was the end of it. That was the end of it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, can I ask you some questions in a different way, Cathy? I just want to ask you, um, going back to what you saw and observed yourself, if someone else had been in the room, just looking on, somebody on the side, and they saw you two during those times, what would they have observed? I think they would have seen two people talking very quietly, very intensely, like they'd something to hide or they wanted to keep something secret or unknown to others around them, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, definitely think they would have seen anxiety on both sides of that or for both of us, you know. Okay. They'd have um, seen anxiety for both of you. Well, yeah, definitely, I think. Okay. And why, what do you think they may, what meaning do you think they may have taken from it? How might they have interpreted it? They're looking from the outside, looking at yeah. the two of you, looking um, anxious. I suppose they would have seen somebody, one person very keen and eager to try to communicate something, the other person recoiling. So they probably would have seen breakdown of communication or a lack of understanding between those two people or... Okay, so a breakdown in communication or a, a lack of understanding between both you and mm. Tom. And what kind of an assumption might they have made? I can only guess um, something had happened to cause that breakdown in communication or that that something might have happened. Yeah. Okay. So can I go back? Um, when you spoke at the beginning, um, your worry was that Tom was creating a space and that maybe that this might happen again. Mm. And then you concluded it would definitely happen. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, over time, you know. Over time, happening. it would definitely yeah. happen. Okay, so on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being it would definitely happen, and 0 mean it was never going to happen, where would you have pegged it, your conclusion that it's going to happen again? Uh, in, in terms of when before? Yeah, 10 being it's definitely going... Yes, yeah, sorry, when you, when, you, uh, when you started to speak first, when I asked you yeah, about... Yeah, would have been about a, an 8 or 9, I'd say. Okay, an 8 or 9, yeah. okay. And having gone through that process of reflecting it from a third party or from yourself in the balcony, what ranking would you have? Would you give the certainty that this was going to happen again? I'd say about a four or five, maybe. So four of a five, as yeah. opposed to an eight or nine. An eight or nine. So instead of just. Right. Like I said, I hate technology. <laughs> Apologies for the blurriness in the first film as well. So yes, I would never ask those two questions one after another. That was for training purposes. And um, I just want to say that what, what I what what I did is try to shake Kathy's conviction that 
maybe I just wanted to get thinking, maybe, maybe, maybe Tom had a different interpretation or and a, a, a different motive. Maybe when he was coming to apologise, there was something else. Maybe that means that I should really listen to him when we go into the joint meeting. So all I'm trying to do is just shake a party a little bit, have that paradigm shift in their thinking. Um, the other, I suppose the final things I want to say around any question from the S questions model that I developed in, in, in that book is, I've designed the questions to do one of two things or both. One is to narrow and focus people's thinking, which is like what I did in the first film. I literally narrowed and focused Kathy's thinking from what she observed to the action that she took and the belief that had informed all of that. And in the other people questions, they're designed to open up and expand the thinking. So she starts to look at other, other perspectives. Um, in each case, they will lead to information, a, a extra additional information or unknown information uh, being available to both parties at mediation. And if both Tom and Kathy share their story with each other, then my guess is I wouldn't even have to go as far as beliefs. And, 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 and normally I don't because the misunderstanding becomes very clear and there's no need to go further. Sometimes it's helpful for me to know what the beliefs of a party are and from what they're from, from where they're working when they make uh, interpretations and assumptions. But in in a in a in an ordinary mediation, I don't go as far as beliefs because I think that would really challenge a, a party to try and figure out, well, what are my, my beliefs? What is this mediator talking about? I, have I come to the wrong kind of session? Is this counselling? So I would be very, 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 very careful that I don't maybe uh, elicit anything that from, like that from a party. And um, always ask them at separate uh, uh, meetings first to check. Always filter the, your question through. Uh, what I call VIX, or one of my students named it as VIX, that your voluntariness, the impartiality, the confidentiality, and the self-determination, those principles of mediation which can't be breached, and definitely be like Colombo. Um, don't be the expert in the room, be the person who's really curious and isn't quite understanding, and I'm a little bit dumb. So, uh, that's it. Um, I don't know, uh, Jeff or Jean, if anybody wants to ask any questions at that stage, at this stage. Um, Jeff, did you want to go or I, I'm happy? Yeah, Jean. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, what you had to say, I can see that happening in, in my own life and just all of us, I'm sure, in our day-to-day -day lives as we make assumptions, whether it's in the business context or the personal yeah. context. So thank you. There are several questions though that are in the chat. Um, and you may have touched on this one um, uh, tangentially, but uh, at what stage do you feel it appropriate to ask, how did that make you feel? And I'm not sure you're gonna ask the feel question, right? Yeah. Uh, after you've taken them through the journey of inference, that's the question. Well, okay, and that's, that's see, everybody wants to know, how do you feel about this? You know, so, so number one is I'll never ask anyone, how, how did that, that make you feel? Because that is then giving the blame to the other party. It's like, look what you've done to her. You have made her feel like this. So what I'll always say to students is, don't ask, how would that make you feel? And even asking a feeling sometimes I think is, 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 is a little bit too frightening for not all, but for some people. But what I would ask is, so what was that like for you? Or, or um, what was the impact on you? Or how was it for you? You know, those kind of questions. Well, when would I ask? Certainly not when I'm going through the journey of inference. If someone becomes upset uh, in any way like that and I feel I need to, I will do it. However, I need in my own head to be very clear where it is I'm going and whether or not I'm going to continue and what are the next stages. My fear if I go off it when it's not necessary, when I go off the series of questions is that I am, I am crashing into their thought process. And it's not about my thought process, about me wanting to know how they feel. It's about their thought process. And I'm taking them right through from step to step to step. That's why I say I don't explore. I don't say, could it, could there have been anything else in the room that you missed? Could it have been you had a bad hair day? Not that I'd ever ask that, but I'm not asking any questions like that. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to go through the exploration right to the very end so that then I know what it is 
uh, not the, not the exploration, the, the series of journey of inference questions. So then I can start to do my exploration. And that's when I can ask, so what was it like for you? Long answer, Jean. Yeah, well, so, that was a great answer. Thank you. Someone else is asking, is the balcony observer only seeing the body language or overhearing the conversation as well? I don't know. I, I think, I think... I think they're doing both, but I think they're doing it from the perspective of out of fear. Because I, I think it was extraordinary when, when I finished the film. And as I said, it wasn't scriptures. And I saw the responses that Kathy took. She was, the balcony was the first one I asked. And her responses were even more broad-minded in, in her thinking when I asked the second question. And I don't know if that's that because the external person is a more powerful question or is it and I think it is because I started with one the balcony first and then that led to more opening and the next question led to more opening again um so I I, I just think they see themselves in a less stressful and vulnerable way so that their amygdala hasn't taken the oxygen and glucose from the rational and logical brain and they can actually see it more clearly they're not in it Okay. And any any Eckhart Tolle students might help me on this one. And Eckhart Tolle suggests that we go to the balcony when we're in a bit of stress and in a heap about something and just look down at ourselves. And I've done it so many times and everything really looks, oh gosh, what are you worried about? This is fine. You know, it looks very different from the balcony. That's a good one to remember. Um, then there's another question here. Could mindful meditation on loving kindness help both people to use other parts of the brain and open them to some form of healthy resolution? Which I have no on? idea. I have no idea, but I, 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 I guess it would because it, cal it calms a person down. I, I mean, I haven't done any research into that, but it does keep calm people down. It does reduce stress levels and it's the stress levels rising that result in the amygdala needing the oxygen and glucose to function until it suits again. So I, I'm sure it must do, but that's not a, an educated response. It's just my, my gut. Um, if anybody else has any questions and would like to either put them in the chat or unmute yourself or um, Jeff, maybe you have have something uh, in particular. Otherwise, uh, you know, wasn't mediation just approved in or formalized in Ireland a few years ago, recent, relatively recently? Uh, we had the Mediation Act 2017, and I note Mr. Bill Houlihan there, who could probably give a whole series on <laughs> the Mediation Act. Uh, there's just actually just one thing I wanted to come back to, Jean, uh, when you said it's everyday life, um, and it's one I use a lot. I, I, I ask people, so, uh, you know, I, I, I hate cooking. I really and truly, I just hate cooking. I'll wash up any day, but I hate cooking. And everybody I know knows this. Now, if I was to invite any of you guys for dinner, right, seven o'clock tonight in my place, what would you do? Accept the invitation and thank you. Oh, you're Look wonderful, Tina. I've never got an answer like that before. <laughs> I usually hear things like... Um, I'll uh, maybe I'll eat before I go or would you like me to bring something? Would you like me to bring some like main course or a salad or something that's, you know, a little bit different or all of these answers come, you know, and I, and I let people give all these answers. Of course, I love it because then I say, I never said I was a bad cook. I just said I hate cooking. But when I say I hate cooking, the assumption is I'm a bad cook. So what can happen is that people come and they say, it's happened so often, they say, this is actually quite nice, Jerry. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, did you make an assumption that I was a bad cook? <laughs> so sorry, Jean, you were asking about mediation act in Ireland or about mediation. In Ireland. Uh, we, we, we've been mediating for years, uh, started by the Family Mediation Service back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Mediation Act is what put it on, on the, the legislative footing. That's great. That's great. Um, someone's wondering if it's uh, possible to add your book to Audible or uh, and do you do online training? Well, I do. I do. Well, adding the book to Audible, the publishers are Canadian. It's New Society Publishing. And if anyone has, this is the book, if anyone has um, 
read the Mediator's Handbook that has come from Jennifer Beer and I can't remember the second author's name. It's the same publisher, New Society Publishing in Canada. And I have my website address, O'Sullivan Solutions, up there beside my name. I run uh, online training. I have a full series of seven modules. I've given you a snippet of one and a tiny clip of a second module. But there's a full series of seven modules with about 10 different role plays with Poor Tom and Kathy, who must be exhausted talking after the training I've been doing at this stage. But uh, yes, yeah, so the next one is in January, starting January the 27th. I do them in, I think the January ones are in the afternoon, which is um, good for the US and Can Canadian side. And then the course in February will be starting in the morning, which is better for, I've had some people from uh, South Africa and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Poland or Romania and Moldova, and that timing is better for them. Uh, have, and I also sell them as video packages, but I haven't advertised them yet, but they are available for purchase as individual modules or as a series. Um, so all of that information is on O'SullivanSolutions.ie. And, and thank you for thank you for the opportunity to uh, to deliver this training. Yeah, the honor is ours. And um, sorry, just sorry, just put up your uh, website in the chat for everybody. Uh, O'SullivanSolutions.ie. And um, before I turn it back to Jeff, I just want to say it's been a wonderful year with all of you, and I'm so glad I could be here this morning. And uh, uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and to, for whatever it is you celebrate, um, I hope all the best for you. Thank you. Jeff? Jean, thank you. Jerry, thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. I know that people will be moved to support uh, your food bank in Ireland and perhaps other food banks around the world. I echo Jean's thoughts. It's been a wonderful year. We wish everybody Happy New Year. We've got wonderful speakers lined up for 2022. We have Phyllis Bernard starting the year for us in January. We've got the former Attorney General of Hawaii, Jean, with whom you're acquainted, who will be uh, addressing us a few weeks after that. Professor Bob Manukin from Harvard Law School is going to be with us in February. We've got wonderful uh, programs. And Jerry, this certainly is a, a wonderful program indeed. We're so happy that you were with us today. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Jean, and thank you, Sarah, and, uh, and everybody for taking the time to, um, to take part and to listen. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, thank you. For, th thanks for supporting food banks, everybody. See you yeah. next year. And with, with that, we are complete.